must apologise for the poor timekeeping entirely my fault. Um, we've had a smashing session, thanks greatly to our two presenters in this session. At this point we vacate the stage. Katie is going to do the introduction for the keynote speech. But thanks very much. It gives me the greatest pleasure to be able to address a group of individuals who have concerned themselves with the environmental problem, which is one of the greatest problems of our time. Indeed, it is one of the greatest problems that has faced humanity in all its millennia of existence. We are at a very critical stage in the history of humanity because we are polluting the environment as no generation has ever polluted it since the human race began. We are the generation that are doing this, and we have to restrain ourselves. I remember when the nuclear weapons case was being argued before the International Court of Justice. One of the lawyers for the anti-nuclear powers said that if Stone Age man, 25,000 years ago, had been able to pollute the environment in a manner which damages us today, we would say, what savages, what brutes, what barbarians. Because we would be affected by what they did. But the difference is this, that Stone Age man, even if he could have damaged the environment for 25,000 years, would not have known what he was doing. But we know full well that what we are doing is damaging the environment, not merely now, not merely for the next generation, but for multiples of 25,000 years. Because nuclear waste has that effect. And we are consciously doing it. And why are we doing it? Well, that's a huge mystery which needs to be examined. But one of the principal reasons is that we have permitted international law to stray away from the high ideals which should have guided it. International law, which would be, should be exercising a restraining influence on all this pollution of the environment, <coughs> is not rising to its responsibilities. The legal profession all over the world is not rising to its responsibilities. The judiciary all over the world is not rising to its responsibilities. They are only concerned with the individual cases they have in hand. 
and this damage to the human future goes on at an unprecedented rate. Now, let's try to examine why this happened, and a brief historical overview would be important. When international law originated, there was a very strong spiritual and philosophical influence in molding its principles. For hundreds of years, international law was molded by the principles of religion and philosophy. And remember, international law is not a new discipline. It is something that goes back three or four thousand years. The ancient Hindu law, for example, visualized that the ultimate sovereign of the world would not be a physical emperor or a chakravarti, but the kingless authority of the law. Three, more than 3,000 years ago, the Hindu jurist said, the world can only be ruled eventually by a system of universal, inter universally applicable international law. And you look at any culture, look at any religion, look at any customary law system, and you always find the long-term perspective as being very important. Look at, for example, Native American custom. It is well recorded that the Red Indians, as they used to call them, used to say that no important decision concerning the human future should be taken without thinking of its impact for seven generations to come. Australian Aboriginal culture is the same. It talks of Mother Earth. If we damage Mother Earth, we are damaging ourselves. If we seriously injure Mother Earth, we are seriously injuring ourselves. And if we kill Mother Earth, we are killing ourselves. Now all these perspectives have been lost. Why? Because international law has launched on a trajectory or on a voyage of its own. How did this happen? This happened mainly because of the wars of religion in the 17th century. You know, there was that terrible war, the Thirty Years' War, which raged from 1618 to 1648, which ravaged so many wonderful parts of Europe, just all in the name of religion. And the great international lawyers of the time, such as Hugo Grotius, who gave their minds to this, they thought, well, we have to work out a system of international law for the future, but in this future there will be so many little states and big states released from the Holy Roman Empire and other empires, all scrambling for survival in this new world. So he worked out a system of international law in his great book, War and Peace, published in 1625, which was in the middle of the, in the midst of the Thirty Years' War. And Grotius very rightly distanced this new discipline from religion and from philosophy. He distanced it because of the wars of religion that were raging, raging then and ravaging cities, killing thousands of people. So Grotius was quite right. But 400 years later, we have no justification whatsoever for keeping international law away from the great teachings of religion. And when we examine the teachings of every religion, we see that every religion emphasizes our duties towards future generations as one of our primary responsibilities. Jesus Christ himself said that it is so important that you should protect the rights of children, that it would be better for anybody who stands in the way of the rights of children to have a millstone round his neck and to be drowned in the ocean. Jesus put it so strongly. And every religion likewise says the same thing. Hindu law was full of concern for the environment. And Kautilya, the Hindu jurist, in 300 BC, he wrote a treatise called the Arthasastra. And in that, the duties of rulers are enumerated in the greatest detail. What should a ruler do in regard to the rivers, the mines, the deserts, the vegetation, the fauna, the flora, and so on. And uh, Kautilya, this was long before the Western writers started thinking of the duties of states. He suggested 30 to 40 departments 
which should function directly under the king, which would be responsible for the care of canals, watercourses, uh, reservoirs, river, uh, rivers, uh, agricultural land, the sea, etc., etc. And that was a very detailed study. Now, likewise, Buddhism. Buddhism, uh, there is a famous episode in the history of Sri Lanka where the son of the emperor mind, Emperor Asoka, was a Buddhist monk. Uh, he was known as Arat mind, son of the emperor Asoka. Might have succeeded to the throne, but he gave it up and became a Buddhist monk. And he came to Sri Lanka and accosted the king of Sri Lanka, who was in the midst of a hunting expedition. And he said, what is the meaning of this you are doing, O oh king? You are killing these animals and so on. Remember, you may be the king of this country, but you are not the owner of this land. You hold it for the benefit of those who are entitled to use it, both now and in the generations to come. So the duty of trusteeship was very strong in Buddhism. And Buddhist teaching also has this beautiful analogy that the environment is there for us to enjoy, for us to use, but not for us to destroy. And the analogy that Buddhism gives is of the bee taking honey from the flower. The bee takes honey from the flower, but leaves the flower intact with all its beauty and all its structure undisturbed. That's how we should use the environment. Now that is Buddhism. Now, likewise, Judaism. There is a lovely story in Judaism that two people were litigating over land and they went before the judge and the judge heard convincing arguments on both sides. He didn't know how to decide the case. So he thought he would bend down and ask the land. So he bent down and told the land, you know these two people are saying they are their owner, they are your owner, please tell me which of them really owns you. And the reply of the land was, they don't own me, I own them. So that was uh, the attitude of Judaism. Uh, so every religion has this. And uh, Islam has a wonderful, a wonderful uh, set of, uh, say, uh, not only sayings in the Quran, the Quran itself says, the faithful followers of the Almighty are those who tread lightly on the earth. You use the earth, you enjoy the earth, but you do not burden the earth. You tread lightly on it. And there is a wonderful uh, hadith, Prophet Muhammad, there are about, as you know, there were tens of thousands of his sayings that were recorded. But the scholars went through them very carefully and weeded out thousands and thousands of them and retained only three or four thousand as being authentic. And here is one of them. It is the parable of the two-decked boat. What is humanity doing to itself? And you can't get a better description. Uh, he says, imagine a boat with two decks. There are people on the upper deck. And as is the human custom, they start quarreling with each other. There are people on the lower deck, and as is the human custom, they start quarreling with each other. But what is even worse is, there is a huge quarrel between the lower deck and the upper deck. So the people on the lower deck desperately want water, but they can't get it because they can't go to the upper deck. So then what happens? Then a hothead on the lower deck says, if water is what you want, I will get you any amount of it, and he takes a pickaxe and is about to make a hole in the bottom of the boat. He said, that is what humanity is doing to itself. It can't solve its quarrels and therefore permits extremists to do things that will damage the entire history of humanity and break the whole human race. And the parable ends at that point. There is the man with the dagger raised. What do you do? First of all, you must stop him from using the dagger. And secondly, you must resolve your quarrels and put your house in order. That is the moral of that parable. And what a beautiful description that is of the world today with the atomic energy, poise, the atomic uh, weapon poised like that, like the sword of Democles, about to destroy the human race. And our legal systems and our international law are doing nothing to declare it illegal. It should be totally illegal. Any Making of a bomb, testing of a bomb, transport of a bomb, storage of a bomb should be illegal and criminal. And that's what I have said in a dissenting judgment I wrote when I was in the court. But 
still international law does not act in that way. And why? Because the five permanent members <coughs> of the Security Council who have veto powers are all possessors of the nuclear bomb. And they enforce one law for everybody else and one law for themselves. So the policeman is telling other people not to do what the policeman is doing. So who would listen to the policeman who says don't do what the policeman is doing on a grand scale? And the policemen are doing this on such a grand scale that they spend nearly a trillion dollars a year on nuclear weapons, despite their total illegality. And there's not enough money to give water to poor people or solve uh, dengue problems or that kind of health problem. But there's any amount of money for nuclear weapons. Now, not only nuclear weapons, but nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is another source of danger because no scientific method has been found for the storage of the waste from nuclear power plants. And all sorts of things are happening. It is quietly dumped in little places, secretly, all over the world. It may even be dumped into the ocean. Uh, I, people were telling me that in Africa, there are chieftains who might even, uh, under cover of secrecy, allow a certain amount of nuclear waste to be deposited on their land in fair consideration of a huge payment they receive. And the result is that for 25,000 years, children <coughs> will be deformed if they, and there will, there will be deformity spreading as a result of it. Let, let me also tell you, when I was on the court and we heard the, one of the, the nuclear testing case, a lady from the Marshall Islands came before the court and said, I've come all the way from the Marshall Islands to tell you judges of the effects of nuclear <coughs> testing in the Pacific Island, in the, in the islands where we have lived for thousands of years. We have always lived very happily. We have had lovely children who have played on the seaside and given us so much pleasure and all that. But after the nuclear testing began, the other day a woman gave birth to a child with two heads, another child with no knees or no toes, another child with a translucent body, and you see the heart palpitating under the body, but it's not like a human being. And when these children are born, what we do is we quickly uh, take the child and bury it somewhere in the, in the sand. Now that's what they, she said, and I've come all the way to tell you judges that this is the effect of nuclear testing that takes place in our traditional territory. So the nuclear powers don't care. The testing is done in other people's territory and the deformity is result to other people's children. Uh, so it doesn't matter very much to them. And what is worse is that the nuclear industry is in alliance with the military. As what President Eisenhower in his famous farewell speech said, so he described it as a military industrial complex, that our lives are going to be increasingly dominated by the power of the military industrial complex. And please beware of it. That was President Eisenhower, who knew more about war than modern American presidents. And Eisenhower was warning the American people in his farewell speech. And what are these powers? There's the political power, there's the military power, there's the economic power, and there's the technological power, all fused together in what you call the military-industrial complex. And that is the power that is polluting the world and polluting it through the multinational corporations of which they are a part. Uh, so this is the tremendous danger that faces us. And why is this happening? As I told you, it's happening because of the separation of international law from religion, number one. It's happening also because of the laissez-faire philosophy. Adam Smith wrote his Wealth of Nations in 1776. And ever since then, there was the idea that those who are in commerce are free to make business dealings, business transactions to the best of their ability. You must not hinder them because that's a curtailment of their liberty. So let them make their contracts. And the result is that contracts are made between corporations which have several multiples of the wealth 
of the poor countries they deal with. Now, uh, of the corporations in the world, there are corporations that have bigger revenues than 175 countries of the world. If there are 190 odd countries in the world, <clears throat> the corporations, uh, there are corporations so big that they are bigger than, uh, uh, apart from 20 countries, bigger than the other 175 countries in their revenues. And these corporations go into poor countries and make contracts. And when they make contracts, of course the lawyers say, well, here's a contract. And the contract has to be honoured. But the fairness of the contract is not looked into. The injustice of the contract is not looked into. And the result is that that poor country suffers terribly <coughs> from inequality of bargaining power. It has got to take the contract as it is offered to it, because otherwise its people might starve. The multinational corporation gets the best terms it can. And when the matter comes to a dispute, there is, of course, uh, the argument always, well, they have agreed to it, and this is a, a international law, honours agreements, so honour this agreement. Of course, there is a trend that is now emerging, where there is international arbitration, of looking at the justice of the contract, uh, interpreting the contract as fairly as possible. And uh, the, uh, Romesh Veeramantri has written a book on that, uh, a detailed book on how uh, the fairness of a contract can be looked into in the administration or determination of an international contract which comes before a court or before arbitrators. That's a detailed study of it, but <coughs> that is only aspirational. You would like to bring those higher principles of interpretation into this, but you cannot still demand it as a matter of right. So international law has got all these weaknesses. And uh, I think we have to start building bridges between the higher moral principles and international law. And I had a great opportunity of drawing attention to this. In a case between Hungary and Slovakia, that case is known as the Gapchikovo case because it dealt with the uh, damming of the waters of the Danube. And uh, as a matter of interest to you, uh, all the judges of the court, the international court, all 15, 15 of us went there, and we saw this huge dam that had been made to dam the waters of the Danube. And uh, I saw my colleagues looking in amazement at the size of this dam. And I could not restrain myself from going up to each of them and telling them, you know, this dam is small compared to the reservoirs made in my country 2,000 years ago, because it was not known to them. But uh, Sri Lanka has the most extensive and higher sophisticated irrigation system ever seen on the planet, according to Arthur Clarke. We had hundreds of huge irrigation systems, all connected by hundreds of miles of channels with a gradient we cannot even now reproduce. And anyway, that was because the kings of the time were so environmentally conscious, maybe under the influence of Buddhism, of their import, of their duty to protect the environment. And as a result of that, we had this magnificent irrigation system. So I told that to my colleagues, who were quite surprised, and I gave them the statistics later, and they thanked me for telling them about something they had not known, which they should have known. So like that, there is so much wisdom resulting from ancient cultures which the modern world knows nothing about. And there is so much plundering going on of the resources <coughs> of the poor countries because international law has distanced itself from religion. So I'm writing as strongly as I can about the importance of bringing together religion and international law because when you leave alone the ritual and the dogma of different religions, but their basic teachings about human conduct the honouring of treaties, the protection of the environment, the care of future generations, uh, the peaceful settlement of disputes, humanitarian conduct in law. All of that is dealt with by every religion and dealt with in detail and dealt with in the same way. And all of this is a huge repository of global wisdom which modern international law is ignoring to its own detriment. This is very sad and we have got to rebuild that bridge 
grosses quite rightly distance discipline 400 years ago we have no reason whatsoever to preserve that distance we have to rebuild the bridges and that is why i wrote that book a uh, few copies might be available here uh, called tread lightly on the earth religion the environment and the human future analyzing uh, hinduism judaism buddhism christianity and islam and showing that the teachings of all five of those religions are identical in regard to our duties to our children and duties to future in uh, future generations and of course we think a great deal of our scientific talent and we think our scientists can do wonderful things now our scientists <coughs> all put their, their heads together cannot make one seed they cannot make one flower <coughs> but nature does this trillions of times every millisecond there's a nice story to illustrate this in hindu law uh, there was a poor cobbler who was a very good man and finally he was so good that he decided to become a hermit in the forest and lord vishnu saw this man and thought he would send him a messenger and when this messenger arrived this poor man was overawed by the messenger and just to make conversation he said when you let, left lord vishnu what was he doing so the messenger said he was sending a camel through the eye of a needle so this man took no notice and he was proceeding with his work uh, behind his meditation the messenger was very annoyed he said what's wrong with you i just told you that lord vishnu was sending a camel through the eye of a needle and you are not responding are you out of your mind he said why should i respond and he said we went down and picked up a seed a tiny seed and said inside this seed is this huge tamarind tree which is bigger than 10 elephants and uh, why should i be surprised that lord vishnu can do that when god is doing this millions of times every millisecond so that can put us in our place Uh, the, you know, when science entered the Western world, the Western world thought it had got a huge amount of wonderful wisdom, which would make it master of the universe. But it is just the reverse of it. All the world scientists put together cannot make one seed or one leaf. They can cross seeds and try to imitate leaves and so on, but they cannot do anything of that sort. So all this scientific talent is being misused, and misused by whom? By the multinational corporations. and the multinational corporations use scientists for their nefarious purposes without telling them the ultimate purpose of their venture you know, for example uh, even as you know when the nuclear bomb was exploded there were lots of scientists who worked on it were working on little details of the science that was required for it and uh, this can be illustrated in this way uh, uh, there was a man the three masons were building the wall of a church somebody went and asked the mason the first mason what are you doing he said can't you see i'm placing brick upon brick and making a wall he asked the second mason what are you doing he said i'm helping to build a wall for this church he asked the third mason what are you doing he said i'm trying to uh, helping to build a cathedral for the glorification of god so you can have three different views of what you are doing but the scientist who is working on some little detail uh, is only looking at that little detail without looking at the broader purposes that will emerge as a result of his research so it is very important for scientists also to have an ethical code which will tell them the limits of what they should be doing and i have long advocated that making a nuclear weapon is a crime against humanity now all that will be very clear if these ethical perspectives are brought to you and i think the future depends very strongly on our being able to get religions and international law together because otherwise the way the nuclear bomb is going the way nuclear energy is going we are building a structure which in 10 or 15 years can destroy all humanity and all all civilization because uh, the next time a nuclear weapon is used it will not be a single nuclear weapon dropped on a city lame duck target but it will be an exchange of nuclear weapons which will create a nuclear winter which will obliterate the devastation <coughs> in vast parts of the earth and end human civilization that has been predicted and we know that full well we are going ahead we do the same with nuclear energy we know its effects full well we are going ahead we have got to bring these perspectives into the scene 
We have got to enrich international law. We have got to awaken our citizens to the importance of this. And most importantly, we should awaken the judiciary and the legal profession to the fact that they are charged with the high responsibility of looking after the ethical principles on which our system of justice depends. And legal professions have traditionally failed in doing this. Take, for example, the legal profession in England. For generations, it permitted slavery. It assisted slavery, despite all its high principles. Where it should have, been shout, should have been shouting from the rooftops, saying we cannot do this in a Christian legal system. Likewise, there are lawyers all over the world who would know that the nuclear weapon is about to abolish or end civilization. They are doing nothing about it. So it is up to organizations like yours, up to every citizen like you, up to every young undergraduate who is awakened to these responsibilities to do what you can. You have a responsibility to the human future and you are custodians of the interests of generations to come. Please rise to the occasion and do what you can to prevent this pilferage and destruction that is threatening all of humanity. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you very much for a very interesting speech. Uh, my name is Priska Metz, I'm from Endika side, and I am, um, I mean, I, I agree with everything you said, but I really have a doubt whether it's a good idea to argue with religion, because I just feel like um, everywhere, at least in the kind of Western civilized world, we see like less and less people being religious, more and more atheism, and I really think many people are even afraid of religion. Like, I mean, it's a very dogmatic kind of, I mean, I know you're, you're arguing from a different point. You're arguing from the kind of values and, and philosophy point of view and ethics point of view, and I fully agree with you, but I just wonder how to, and the second <coughs> difficulty I see is because it's so separate. It's like something private. Like religious, religion, in, at least in our society, kind of it's perceived as like a private business of everybody. So it's not something that people would want to be the guiding principles of. of. So I, I just wonder how you, how you think this can be overcome, because yeah, I, fully, I fully see the need. But. I think it can be, can you hear me? I think it can be overcome by peace education being made compulsory in all schools. Peace education is education on the principles of peace and justice. Can you hear me? Do I need to use this? I, I think I don't believe. Peace education is education on the principles of peace and justice, which every citizen of the world society of the future needs to know. And you cannot be a world citizen unless you know something of the basic beliefs of large sections of the people. Now, as we are now, and our education systems are now, we are born into a cultural box. You may be a Christian, you may be Muslim, you may be Hindu, whatever it is. You live your whole life within that box, and you know nothing about the wisdom of all the other religions. Now, that is part of your birthright, to know something of the wisdom of all the religions of the world, because it contains such wonderful material. And you ask a Christian something about the Quran or about Islam, he'll know absolutely 
nothing. And you will likewise the other way around. Now that will not do. We have got to forget our nationality question and work towards the one world of the future if humanity is to survive. And we cannot do that unless we know something of the backgrounds of other people and their traditions. I'm not talking here about the dogma and the rituals of religion. That's a matter for each religion. I'm talking about the rules of conduct prescribed for all human beings. And you take all the religions and you'll find the total coincidence of it. This is why all I want to stress. And I might say that I was fortunate <coughs> that I went to a government school when I was uh, born. And uh, that school had an assembly every morning at which the principal read to the whole school for five minutes, today from the Bible, tomorrow from the Quran, the next day from the Bhagavad Gita, the next day from the Dhamma Bhagavad And we knew something about all these four religions, even as little fellows of 12 or 13. So that gave us an opening into the wisdom of other religions, and I do not see how we can deny that opportunity to the children of tomorrow. Thank you. Um, do we have the gentleman in back over here? Hello everyone, my name is Harvard. I'm a, I'm a MH student in International Comparative Legal Study at SAMAS. One of my modules is International Environmental Law. I just want to ask a, a question to the gentleman regarding of, uh, the application of religion and to the environmental issue. Most of the problems with the environmental damage are nowadays happening in the developing world, like you know, India, Iraq, Sudan, and, and, and others. And whereas there is, religions have a powerful uh, tool in those countries. And also, and also, you know, when it comes to carbon monoxide trade, international trade, Organization use or international lawyers use a theological perspective into this kind of business. Whereas, you know, they are one of the factors causing so much damage to the environment. I think, you know, religion is one of the fact, religion as a whole is one of the factors that damages the environment uh, uh, nowadays. How does religion damage the environment? You know, the, the, the bodies, the, the main. International bodies use religion, use religion, as that, I say, as, that, as an that, example. That because they don't understand yeah. the basic principles and the total unity in the basic principles of human conduct. That's our fault, we are. Religion might explain, might give some uh, uh, principles, some mechanisms to uh, look at the uh, environment. But on the other side, in fact, uh, it's very limited. But, you know, using religion is, is in my opinion, is another uh, problem. The international trade lawyers use theological uh, uh, perspective of religion that how uh, uh, the environment should be looked at. Religion strengthens the principles of international law. It does not provide the mechanism. It is for international law to provide the mechanism. But the basic principles of international law are reinforced considerably and are universalized by showing that all the religions support them. And I can demonstrate that there's that book in relation to the environment where I've shown, uh, likewise, I, in international <coughs> trade, uh, international, the law of OIC, humanitarian <coughs> conduct, treatment of diplomats, peaceful settlement of disputes, rights of future generations. It's all there. And we are just plundering the rights of future generations. That is all. These religions are agreed on that. And I should tell you that I will, in Europe, I am attending a conference next week, uh, which deals with an ombudsman for future generations. Now, one of the weaknesses of our legal system is this. You know, you go before a court of law, and the court of law can only protect you if you appear before the court of law and stand up for your rights. Otherwise, the court of law can't prevent you. Our legal systems are so defective. So these poor children who are not yet born, and 10 generations away, they can't appear in the court of law. So we trample on their rights. We can do that with impunity, because they are not there 
to come before the court of law. So I have advocated, you know, that for a long time, that there should be in every country and in every court an official known as the Ombudsman for Future Generations, who must take up any cause where the rights of future generations are being affected. He should have the right of audience in a court, come forward and be able to tell the court this can't be done because it's going to affect those children yet unborn. And this conference that I have to attend shortly is about an ombudsman for legal systems in <coughs> the world. Thank you. So I, I think one of the principal points then is that uh, the teachings of religion have been manipulated by oh, certain authorities. Certainly, for, and, person, for profit. Yes, and that the institutions of religion should be separated from the actual teachings as well. Um, yes, of course, thank you. Um, can I have this lady have a question next, please? Hello, um, my name is Natalie. Hi, I'm Sam Barrister. And um, one of the, it's really interesting the idea of an advocacy for future, an advocate for future generations. I've, I've been watching uh, the anti fracking, you know, the, the fracking um, question, and um, it seems as if government is trying to pay uh, people to, to accept it in their areas, well, you know, like, like buying, them, buying them off. So, um, because obviously they're aware it could be it could be dangerous and cause harm. So I just wondered what you think about that. Yeah. Anti fracking campaigns and It seems that the governments are aware that that's harmful and concerns people that it's harmful and they're offering money to areas that will allow it to happen in their areas. And I just wondered what you think of that but and what, what could be done. It's completely wrong if it's going to damage the environment. They can't be doing that. <laughs> and that people should be rising up in protest and saying you can't do this. And the trouble is many governments are in league with financial interests. There are lobbying interests that affect government decisions. So all that is all wrong, it needs to be stopped. And it can only be stopped by an enlightened public who know these basic principles. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Kate. Kate Hodgson, Concerned Citizen and Solicitor. Thank you very, very much. Um, if I may ask you the direct question, what role, if any, do companies play in environmental protection? At present, they play a minimal, minimal role, but I think they can be stimulated to use their power and their financial might to do something to protect the environment. But the trouble with corporations is this, that first of all, there is the free trade principle. And they are entitled, they say, to freedom of contract. Second, they are trustees for their shareholders. So they say, maybe there is some danger here, but we are primarily trustees of the money of our shareholders. And we have to look after that. But that's another long story. We have not to have shareholders past financial conglomerates that invest in them. But they say we have to look after the interests of the shareholders. And they also say that this is freedom of contract, which they are entitled to pursue. And that they are entitled, if the other party has agreed to it, to ask for the enforcement of the contract. So all of these have got to be shown to be false. And it's the international lawyers who can show this. They are not doing that adequately. But I think they are beginning to be uh, concerned about this and trying to show that corporations have got to uh, sense these higher values. And there is also the fact that, uh, as Eisenhower himself said, the military industrial complex is in possession of so much power that it is itself contrary to democratic principle. So we should bring that under the microscope and see what could be done to restrain it. 
in terms of the basic principles of law. And this is why I feel that legal professions across the world are sleeping on their watch. In fact, many years ago, I wrote a book called The Slumbering Sentinels. It was about 30 years ago. It was a penguin book uh, saying that lawyers and judges were sleeping over their duty of protecting our human rights. And the penguin artist drew a judge in full judicial regalia fast asleep on the bench and for the cover picture. And uh, this book uh, created some impact because it was taken up by the Secretary General of the UN. And he referred to it chapter by chapter and said that unless we give the author's warning, we will all join the club of the slumbering sentinels. And as a result of that, many UN activities resulted, trying to protect uh, human rights in the face of the advancing power of science. Because power was eroding our rights as far as the human body was concerned, as far as human society was concerned, and as far as the human environment was concerned. All of these are being eroded every day by the work of science. So the law has got to keep that in check. And it's very important that law is to be sensitized to this. So that, uh, I think there is some activity going on in that area, but uh, uh, lawyers really need to be alerted to this. And they say also that when I was in Japan and I studied their legal system, I found that the Japanese bar had committees of different uh, charts with responsibility in different areas uh, to survey legislation, propose legislation, and so on, and bring to the notice of the authority violations of human rights. And there is a committee there that looks into the impact of science on society. Like that, I think every bar association in the world should have a committee that looks into these things and advises both the legal profession and the government that these dangers might result from such and such an activity. And the bar is not doing that. Thank you. We've just got time for one more question. Can we have a gentleman in the um, checkered purple shirt? Thanks. My name's Jay Quite. I'm at Friends of the Earth. Um, I just wondered if I could um, invite you, Judge Wiramatri, to comment on the, the threat to which oil and gas in particular, oil and gas extraction and oil and gas combustion <laughs> poses uh, in terms of a, as, as a threat to environmental protection. I think you spoke very eloquently about the threats of nuclear energy and indeed the threat of nuclear weapons to the environment. Difficult, dif dif difficult perhaps to disagree with that. But I wonder where you saw the threat that uh, the high carbon economy that we're currently locked into features in that overall hierarchy. I see as a grave omission the lack of attention to developing solar energy and wind energy, wind energy and wave energy. Solar energy alone is enough to provide all the energy requirements of the whole world. Solar energy research has been blocked for a long time by oil interests. Now it is time that people devoted more energy, effort and energy to developing uh, solar energy and trying and also put a break on uh, all these uh, activities, uh, oil, oil uh, extraction that damage the environment. It, uh, I think it seems so obvious that solar energy is available free of charge. They are just not tapping it because it didn't suit the oil interest. But it's time to do all of Okay, uh, thank you again very much, Judge Wiramantri. Um, Judge Wiramantri has kindly brought along um, some copies of his latest book, Treading Lightly on the Earth, which I understand aren't available to purchase in the UK. So if you wish to um, snaffle one, they'll be available um, during the conference fair to purchase for £20. Um, can I invite you to thank Judge Wilmantry again.